Okay, so it's been a while, but I assure you I've been working on the streamliner in the background the whole time. Like I said, finding a place to run these things is the hardest part of speed running, but I've made a lot of progress over the last couple of months. I did a bunch of runs on the version three of the streamliner, which I had in the last video. The TPU wings provided a lot of rollover stability, but they easily got caught in cracks in the pavement and they really didn't provide any meaningful amount of downforce. You know, as I've talked about before, a huge part of radio controlled speed racing is the need to reach top speed within a reasonable distance. So obviously all wheel drive is something most speed run cars implement, not impossible, but very difficult with this particular car's design. I think adding downforce is going to be much easier. I've been doing data logging with every run of the streamliner and the data shows pretty clearly that the streamliner isn't at all drag limited within the speeds that the current motor is capable of spinning. Even doubling the drag in the name of downforce won't limit the top speed at all. So what's the best way to make downforce for this? Well, you can do like I did in version three, add wings, but it tends to be lower in efficiency than other methods. And it's really difficult to package for a long, narrow car like this. Um, to generate a reasonable amount of downforce at this scale, uh, the wing has to be fairly long in length, um, which means it's going to be fragile and most likely I would need two sets of wings, one in the front and one near the rear, um, so that I can keep the nose planted um, when hitting a bump. This led me to look into ground effect or venturi tunnels or underfiller diffusers, which are used all over uh, motorsports today. These can be orders of magnitude more efficient than wings. I really had no idea what I was getting into uh, actually going down this path. Most modern race cars today have uh, actual flat floors or relatively shallow venturi tunnels that run the length of the car, leading to an expansion area or an outlet section at the back of the car. The diffusers typically have a relatively square profile with some rounded edges. So based on this, the first design I tried to use was just a square diffuser profile with a curved entry up entry to try to feed more air into the diffuser but it ended up having three times as much drag as the base model without the diffuser. If I hit a bump, the front of the diffuser actually generated a lot of lift and would catch the air up near the nose. So I actually found this out due to a meshing error and realized the actual importance of testing all the uh, CFD error designs in different uh, modes of pitch and uh, yaw. So I went online and read a lot of research papers over a couple of months. But most of those papers really focused on existing diffuser designs and optimizing those. Finally, I found some papers featuring some more you know, creative diffuser designs, and they listed a lot of the principles on why they use those more creative designs. And so, you know, while I'm not an aerodynamicist by any means, uh, I wanted to share at least what I've learned thus, thus far for this particular car. First, the diffuser's exit is far more important than its entry. The majority of diffusers designs I saw had a smooth upward uh, curved entry to drive more air into the car. But in this situation with this long car, uh, the diffuser already had more than enough air flow relative to its expansion ratio. In fact, uh, bringing more air in actually increased uh, diffuser losses, it lowered downforce and uh, increased drag significantly. Now I did mildly curve up the nose on version four of the streamliner not specifically for aerodynamic purposes, but uh, for additional ground clearance as versions three's nose uh, would scrape or get caught on debris very easily. But it does feed a little bit more air under the car and does lower the downforce marginally. But the biggest gain I found from the curved up nose was that it greatly lowered the car's sensitivity to uh, pitch meaning that the downforce uh, wasn't as sensitive to ride height and to the changing angle of the overall car. As I shrunk the inlet to the diffuser, I kept bringing the kick-up point of the diffuser further and further forward until you know, almost the entire length of the streamliner was a diffuser, um, you know, thinking that I would ultimately generate more downforce. Oddly, this huge long diffuser didn't make any more downforce than a smaller one. It actually had a lot more drag. Uh, so there is an ideal length for a diffuser in a given situation, and the longer a diffuser is, the more drag it creates, and there's a lot more chance for a high pressure that's all around the outside of the diffuser to basically leak in along the length of the diffuser and lower its efficiency. 
So I iterated on the diffuser profile some more, but ultimately I couldn't get it to be as efficient as a wing or an airfoil. My intuition was that the square shape was causing too much drag as I was getting a lot of vortices coming off the square shape at the back of the car. So back to the research papers again. In motorsports, diffusers are typically kind of square in profile, usually only several inches tall at their exit. And that's not because it's the best design for a diffuser, but it's because it's the best design for what the rules allow and packaging it between the two rear tires. This car doesn't have to follow any rules and I don't need to fit the diffuser between two tires since I've only got a single middle rear tire. So the optimal shape varies along the length of the vehicle, but it happens to be uh, something that looks more like a McDonald's arch. So why is this? Well, it has really to do with uh, vortices. And I'm not gonna go into all the details of how this all works, but a diffuser with uh, sp essentially spinning air inside it has lower losses and a thinner boundary layer and thus uh, can create more downforce and actually operate at a steeper kick-up angle. Also, if you have a deep enough Venturi tunnel, a la something like the Aston Martin Valkyrie, um, you can actually spin up the vortices faster with the high pressure air that is trying to mix with the low pressure air as it kind of comes into the diffuser. This is really just a function of the shape of the diffuser itself and having extremely deep diffuser tunnels. You can clearly see the difference in the vortices inside the diffuser between the square and the uh, arched profile. Uh, and it actually more than doubled the efficiency of the diffuser compared to the square profile. And I was able to essentially run a smaller diffuser, which was you know, much less ride height sensitive and had less drag. So now it stands at roughly uh, double the initial drag figures that I have with no diffuser, but it has 30 times as much downforce and the overall lift to drag ratio is around four to one, which is pretty decent for something this size. It would be terrible for something as large as you know, a full-size race car, but in the small scale and the ride heights I'm having to run for an RC car, I think this is really good. Version four has proven to be the easiest design to drive by far. Um, the diffuser really doesn't get caught easily on the ground since it runs the full length of it. It's still easy to spin the car out at, at slow speeds because you just have so much power and there's some cogging, um, but it's almost impossible to roll over and the downforce really starts to be quite noticeable at about 60 mile an hour. It's still really touchy until about 60 mile an hour just because of the amount of power, but once it hits 60 mile an hour, you can you know, start getting on it pretty hard and it hooks up. So I've made 30 plus runs on this setup and it's been great. Uh, most of the runs were up to between 60 and 80 mile an hour just because of the test site that I had to run on. Faster. But on the last run of the day, I pushed it and I really cranked on the throttle once it hit 60 mile an hour and it hooked up uh, and actually hit 133 mile an hour. But it was not a, uh, it was not good. So it was quite windy that day and I'm fairly certain that a gust of wind uh, caught the car because it just veered um, left very rapidly and the car went flying off the road. You can actually see from the wear on the front tires. The gyro tried very hard to correct the slide, but at that speed uh, with those little tiny tires, it had no hopes at all of doing that. Um, luckily, the damage overall to the streamliner was very minimal, even though it went over 100 feet off the road and through a fence. There is a possibility that the car bottomed out and that's what caused it to veer off. You know, I do mark the bottom edges of the diffuser every run with a Sharpie pen. Usually only the ends of the diffuser ever have any wear marks, but on the last run, uh, the Sharpie was worn off from front to rear on the diffuser. So obviously the suspension needs to be a lot stiffer and the downforce was most likely causing it to just scrape the diffuser. While I'm at it, I'm probably gonna drop the downforce levels a bit. Um, hence, I've put some cutouts out here at the rear for future testing and hopefully it'll help the break over angle a little bit more on the streamliner as well. I'm also excited I bought a much bigger motor and for that motor, I'm definitely going to have to implement uh, traction control. And really this car definitely needs anti-lock braking because I really can't put the brakes on very hard at this point without it destabilizing the car. And who knows, I may even throw on a parachute because I think once I'm up over hundred mile an hour, parachute's actually gonna do something. So overall, I'm really stoked that I hit 133 miles per hour. Um, I know the 
official world record for a 3D printed car, really only had a 3D printed body shell that sat on top of a normal RC car, um, is 180 mile an hour. I don't know of another fully 3D printed monocoque car like this exceeding 133 miles per hour, um, but I'm definitely not done. I think the bigger motor, you know, along with the traction control and some other changes are going to really allow me to be able to crank it up to at least 150 uh, plus mile an hour. So I'm really excited about that. Let me know what you think in the comments. Well, that's all for this video. Take care out there and uh, stay safe.